This is Taiwan Insider, a weekly news roundup brought to you by Radio Taiwan International. Every week we give you an inside look at the biggest and most interesting stories coming out of Taiwan. I'm Natalie So. And I'm Andrew Ryan, and here's your Week in a Minute. The KMT has picked Kaohsiung Mayor Han Guoyu as its 2020 presidential candidate. That's after Han won a nationwide telephone poll with 44.8% of the vote. Han says despite his candidacy, he's not quitting his job as Kaohsiung Mayor. President Tsai is in the Caribbean on a visit to four of Taiwan's allies. She received a medal from St. Kitts and Nevis and attended the groundbreaking of a hospital in St. Lucia. Lin Fei Fan, a leader of the 2014 Sunflower Student Movement, has joined the DPP in a leadership role. Not all party members are happy. Some are demanding Lin apologize for past criticism of party officials, but Lin says he wouldn't have taken the job if he thought the party was fine as it was. Taiwanese tennis stars Xie Su Wei and Letitia Jan won the women's and mixed doubles titles at Wimbledon on Sunday, Xie with Czech partner Barbara Strakova and Jan with Croatian partner Ivan Dodig. NTU Hospital says it kept a patient alive with an artificial heart for 50 days. A Taiwanese woman was stung by a bee last October and went into cardiac arrest. After weeks on an artificial heart, the woman received a transplant, and doctors say her body has since returned to normal. And that's your Week in a Minute. Every week at the top of the show, we each come up with some words of the week mm -hmm. that we think describes the show or the week. Yes. So, do you want to guess my word? Yes. What do you have? Let's see. Control. Con counter continental. Con <laughs> contenders. <laughs> contenders. <laughs> Well, we know the new uh, KMT presidential candidate, so we'll be talking about him, Han Guori, the yeah. cultural mayor. Also, Tsai Ing-wen is the other contender. We'll be telling you a little about what she's been doing this past week. So the two contenders for president so far. We'll Excellent. Them. That's a very good word of the week. <laughs> I've uh, decided to do something a little bit different. Okay. I have a word that is connected to both of these contenders, but only tangentially. Sure. That's okay. Permissible, this, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> this word will be mentioned in relationship to both of them, even though it seems like it has nothing to do with Han Guoyu or Tsai Ing-wen. No, All right, you ready? I'm curious. Kosher? No. <laughs> Korea? Aha, Korean! <laughs> Aha. So, I think I know where you're going with part of this. Yes, well, um, I'm almost tempted to not say what the connection is and make people watch the whole show okay, to we'll see. Okay, we'll be telling you in the whole show, That's actually. right, to see if you can find out how this word is connected to uh, Taiwan's president and also the... That's uh, right. Han Goryu, who is the right. mayor of Kaohsiung. Okay, That's so you right. have to watch the whole show today. <laughs> yes, as you should every week. And it's week. the fun parts that show why they're related. So, um, coming up in today's show, we have two analysts, political analysts, that give us their thoughts on the new KMT presidential candidate, Kaohsiung Mayor Han Goryu, and why he won the primary. And um, also, we'll be looking at a fake election picture that's trending on social media, and also learning some fun facts about Taiwan tea. All righty, and also, we want you to take a look at this photo. So that actually looks like a painting, a glowing painting, but it really is a photo. And this photo was taken somewhere on an outlying island in Taiwan. The question is, what is in that photo that's making it glow? and where was it taken? We'll have the answer for you at the end of our show. We turn now to our top story. The main opposition Kuomintang, or KMT, has chosen a presidential candidate. Let's take a look. The KMT cheers for the party as polls just selected the party's presidential candidate, Mayor Han Guoyu, who rose to political stardom when he won the Kaohsiung mayor election last year. First, I want to thank all the good friends who supported Han Guoyu and the general public for your support. For those who have been critical, I hope that will come to an end. The KMT used nationwide telephone polls for the first time to choose their candidate. Five pollsters surveyed over 15,000 people. Han won with 44.8 percent. Foxconn founder Terry Go got 28 percent. Former New Taipei City Mayor Egg Chu got 18 percent. And the fourth and fifth place candidates got less than 10 percent. In against President Tsai and Taipei Mayor Ke Wenze, Han came in a strong first with 47.7 percent. The top came to candidates all came out ahead of candidates from other parties, but Mayor Han had the strongest lead. So will Han continue on as Kaohsiung Mayor? I will continue to manage the city as Kaohsiung Mayor. I'll do all I can to give what I promised to the city residents. Can Han unite his rivals? I'll meet with them as soon as we get in touch who will be his vice presidential running mate. We will announce it after we have selected one. 
The other top two candidates, Terry Goh and Eric Chu, were visibly absent from the press conference. Now Han will have the challenge of uniting the party and managing Kaohsiung as he runs for president. Now, as you can see there, Han Guoyu, the Kaohsiung mayor, he led in the polls with a big margin. We turn now to political analyst Courtney Donovan-Smith for some insight into his appeal. Well, what's very interesting about him is if you watch the way that he, he, he campaigns, the way he is around people, he, <clears throat> he's very much n- doesn't appear to be from the background that he is. Mm. Um, he's originally from a military family. Um, with sort of a traditional uh, from China sort of family. But he comes across very much uh, as being very, very Taiwanese in his body language, in his manner of speaking. <clears throat> he's very ingratiating uh, and he's very charismatic. I mean, he, he's, he's, he, he, he's very believable as somebody you'd know you know, uh, he's an uncle, he's, you know, a friend of the family kind of guy. And he, when he, he does his campaigns, uh, campaign rallies and a lot of his activities, it's interesting to watch that he always makes sure to not appear in any way stiff or anything other than a man of the people. Mm. He always wears a blue shirt, not a suit. And, you know, if it starts raining... He doesn't bring an umbrella at his rally. Uh, he'll just get wet. Um, <laughs> you'll notice he doesn't come in through the stage at the back. He comes through the crowd, oh. even though that's not the smartest way to go. But And it shows the crowd getting excited. Mm. And you watch the, his body language, the way he shakes hands with people. He's always very ingratiating. He's always... Mm. And another thing that's very, uh, very... One of the, I think, very positive things about him is he is always positive. He doesn't go negative. Uh, his campaigning has always been a very sort of positive, let's get along kind of, uh, uh, kind of thing. And I think a lot of people respond to him and quite like him as a result. This week, I also spoke with political analyst Ross Feingold, who tells us why he thinks Mayor Han won over the other top KMT contenders. He's still riding on a lot of enthusiasm among his supporters that carried over from the Kaohsiung mayor election last year. Terry Go, unfortunately for him, got into the election a little late. Eric Drew didn't seem to really inspire much enthusiasm among the public generally. And keeping in mind that the poll was, the telephone poll was among the public. It wasn't just KMT voters or KMT members. Uh, so we saw that Drew just didn't really inspire much enthusiasm. Go got in too late. And Han had the carryover of enthusiasm. So uh, from one perspective, it was mostly Han's enthusiasm and the enthusiasm among his supporters. Another perspective also to keep in mind is for the other two guys, there wasn't much that they did to help themselves win. Hmm. Um, Well, do you think enthusiasm is enough to enable him to win the presidential election? It worked in Kaohsiung. Will it work in the presidential election? Probably not. And he's going to be forced to come up with some policies uh, and let the voters nationally know, not just say, uh, here in Kaohsiung, things are bad. I have better ways. Uh, I'm going to make Kaohsiung prosper. It worked last year. Whether or not it will work nationally, the answer is probably not. And he's going to have to come up with some more specific policies if he's going to win a national election. Now, if you'd like to check out the entire interview, you can check out the RTI English YouTube channel. We're now going to a scene in New York City where President Tsai Ing-wen was spotted buying some bagels. Let's take a look. I have to say, I always like seeing um, presidential candidates doing things that normal people That's would do. That's true. Shopping. And bagels. Bagels. Yum. <laughs> that, that makes me miss bagels. <laughs> yeah, me too. So she spent two days and two nights in New York on her way to the Caribbean. Let's take a look at some more highlights from her trip. 
The trip was Tsai's first to New York as president. It was also the first time that a Taiwan president was able to hold a reception for UN representatives of diplomatic allies at Taiwan's representative office with the media there. Now, other highlights included meeting with U.S. Congress people and a private speech at Columbia University. President Tsai is visiting four Caribbean allies, Haiti, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and St. Lucia. She has received a warm welcome and is strengthening ties with allies in the region. Her 12-day trip will end on July 22nd with a two-day, two-night stopover in Denver. One thing that's new about President Tsai's latest trip is that she's been having two days and two nights in each U.S. stopover. So what is the role of U.S. transits in U.S.-Taiwan diplomacy? Well, that's the topic of today's Taiwan Explained. In today's Taiwan Explained, I'm going to tell you about the role transit stops have played in U.S.-Taiwan diplomatic history. All righty, Nellie, are you ready? All right, I'm ready. Deep breath, 60 seconds on the clock, go. Taiwan-U.S. presidential stopovers are symbolic of U.S.-Taiwan ties. Now, Lee dan was the first to ask for one. The U.S. let him refuel in Honolulu, but did not let him leave the military airport. Lee, in protest, did not leave his airplane and wore pajamas when a U.S. official met him. The next year, the U.S. let him attend his Cornell University reunion, where he spoke about Taiwan democracy. But China was furious and shot missiles near Taiwan, leading up to the first Democratic presidential elections. And the U.S. also sent aircraft carriers to the region. Lee dan won the election. Now, Tsun Sui-bian was the first Taiwan president to visit New York City. But near the end of his term, when he was not on good terms with the U.S., they made him transfer in Alaska, which he said was inconvenient, uncomfortable, and indecent. Now, Ma ying enjoyed many U.S. stopovers with little fuss from Beijing. And the highlight of Tsai Ing-wen's recent trip was that she got to meet U.N. envoys at Taiwan's representative office. Can I add a line? Yes, of course. And speak at Columbia University. Excellent job, Natalie. And that is this week's Taiwan Explained. Up next, Taiwan by number. Each week on Taiwan by Number, we bring you a facet of life in Taiwan by way of some digits. And this week, Nally, we're going to be talking about tea. Cool. Do you know anything about tea? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't drink too much tea, so. Good. This is going to be fun. I probably won't get anything right. <laughs> okay. So first of all, uh, one of the most popular types of tea is the types of teas that you can order at the drink shops in Taiwan. So everything from bubble tea, boba, pearl milk tea, shou yao bei, the, the shaken teas. So my question for you is, to get things started, is how many of these drink shop teas does the average person in Taiwan drink in one year? A hundred? A hundred. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, we're going to have the tea, I know. <laughs> we're going to have the answer for you in just a moment. But first, what does it take to become a professional tea picker in Taiwan? Well, like most things, uh, you have to take an exam in order to be certified. Now, recently, a group of 16 women in a rural village in the central county of Yunlin took the exam, and almost all of them passed. Let's have a look. <laughs> 15 women from Guilin Village in Yunlin County have gotten their certification for picking tea. The youngest of the group is 18-year-old Zhang Yixuan. I've been drinking tea since I was little, she says, and it piqued my interest. Zhang says her mother would take her into the fields to pick tea when she was little. Now a high school grad with the certification, she can earn up to 1,000 Taiwan dollars or 30 U.S. a day. The oldest member of the group is 72-year-old Liu Chouxin. She's been picking tea for decades. With deft hands, she can make up to 3,000 Taiwan dollars or 100 U.S. a day. She easily passed the skills portion of the test, but unable to read, she was unable to pass the written exam. Liu says she's going to sign up to take the exam again, but she'll need to study extra hard. In the past, tea picking was a skill you learned from your elders. But these days, the certification is helping improve the quality and safety of the process and turning traditional tea pickers into licensed experts. Well, I'm really sad that the older woman didn't pass. I think they should have found a way to give her a test, perhaps an oral test or something to help her a little bit. Yeah, it is kind of sad, especially when you consider the fact that she's probably one of the best tea pickers in all of Taiwan. That's not, a, not an easy job. Not an easy job at all. But she can make way more money than the other people can make uh, per hour just by t picking leaves. So clearly she's doing it the right way. 
Well, so before we watched that report, I asked you the question of how many of the drink shop teas Taiwanese people drink on average per year, and you said. A hundred. A hundred. I was thinking of some people in my family. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's have a look at the answer. Oh, that's not too bad. Well, better than <laughs> some people I know. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it still does have a lot of sugar in them, so you do have to yeah, be careful. Yeah, that's still a lot. And also, I should mention that that includes everyone in Taiwan, even the babies, and I'm sure they're not drinking bubble okay. tea. Okay, I think some people are drinking more than others. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we won't name names. <laughs> Okay, so actually, Taiwanese people drink about a billion of those drinks every year. A billion total. That's a lot. That's amazing. Yeah. So now I want to uh, move on uh, to the tea that's used in these drinks. So of all the tea that's produced in Taiwan, what percentage goes into these drink shop teas? Oh, maybe forty percent. Okay, that's a very good guess. Let's have a look at the answer. Oh, so even less. Less. So about thirty percent of all the tea. Although you have to remember that a lot of the tea that's used in those drinks is imported, uh, largely from places like Vietnam. Uh, now, some experts even say that without uh, the drink shops, Taiwan's tea industry could even collapse because thirty percent is significant. That's a lot. It is. I don't think they're going to collapse. I don't think Our they people will. are going to keep on drinking. Them. Oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's not going anywhere. All right. So next, I want to talk about、uh, the tea and where it's grown in Taiwan. Last year, in 2018, Taiwan produced about 15,000 metric tons of tea. Oh my gosh! It's a lot of tea. It's a lot of tea. Yes, and the, the almost every single city and county in Taiwan produces tea. However, the one county that produces more than every other place in Taiwan is this county. That's Nanto County in central Taiwan. So my question for you is. Of all the tea that's produced in Taiwan, what percentage comes from Nanto? Like forty percent. Forty percent. That's also a good guess. Let's have a look at the answer. Wow,、well, that's a lot. It、They're、is a lot of pulling their weight there, huh? Sixty-eight percent. That's amazing.、Uh, and the reason is is because people love their high mountain oolong teas, and of course, Nanto has a corner on the market when it comes to big mountains. Yeah. So my final question is: I want to talk about one of Taiwan's most exquisite teas.、Uh, it is a bit more rare and more difficult to produce, and it has a great flavor. It's called Dongfang Meiren Cha, or Oriental Beauty. Have you heard I've it? I've heard of it. it. Sounds exotic. I don't know what I know. Tasted it though. Okay. So this tea, what makes it so interesting is that the flavor is actually created by little bugs nibbling on the leaves. I had no idea. I'm glad I never had it before. <laughs> Well, that actually creates a, a very interesting taste. It creates a chemical reaction within the leaves,、oh, uh, and it gives it the unique taste that it has that makes it different from other oolong teas. Now, this tea is so exquisite that every year it's a summer tea. So every year in the summer in Shinju County, which is the most、uh, popular place for this tea to be grown, experts gather together and they choose the top grade of Oriental Beauty tea. And then, so this is the top grade out of all of the teas that are submitted. So, like maybe thirteen hundred batches of tea, and then everybody watches to see how、uh, much money that tea will go for. And they're actually going to be doing this this Sunday. So, my question for you, Natalie, is: for the top grade tea this year, what is the projected price for kilogram in U.S. dollars? U.S. dollars is it a whole lot? It's a whole lot. Wait, a thousand U.S. dollars? Mm, you might want to go up a little bit. <laughs> Five thousand. All right, are you ready for the answer? That's a lot already. <laughs> It is a lot already. Okay, let's have a look at the answer. Oh my gosh! I can't believe that. Twenty-six thousand U.S. dollars、tea. just for tea, and just to give you an idea of like how much this tea would go if you're going to buy a little can of loose leaves.、Uh, so usually those cans are about 150 grams. That will go for about four thousand U.S. dollars. <laughs> oh my gosh! So you're not going to be buying. I don't think、any? I'm going to be drinking that anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> If you、um, have some and you'd like to make a cup for me and Natalie, we would love to sample it. I would like to sample it. Yeah, you can leave a comment below. <laughs> All right. I, actually, I have one more thing to say、oh, too. Oh, okay, great. This tea has another interesting name. It's called Peng Feng Cha or Braggart's Tea, and some people say that's because the price has gone up so much. So even though the little bugs are nibbling on your leaves, and you can only take about forty or fifty percent of those leaves to market. The price has almost tripled in the last decade. So 
those tea growers have a lot to brag about. They're pretty rich too, huh? No. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, let's go on to our next segment, hashtag Taiwan, and see what's trending on social media. This week on Hashtag Taiwan, RTI social media expert Leslie Liao tells us what's trending in Taiwan. Hey, everybody. Hey, Leslie. How's it going, Leslie? Good. So what do you have for us this week? Well, this week we found out who the two major contenders are going to be in next year's presidential election. So, of course, that's what people are talking about. Uh, we begin with a tweet from Brian Hyo who says, Korean fish versus English vegetable. Now, of course, uh, Korean fish and English vegetable, those are homonyms. Hangoryu sounds like Korean fish in Mandarin. And of course, uh, Thai Yingwen sounds like vegetable English as well. Korean Friedman boiled down the 2020 election to just four emojis. Korean flag, fish emoji, UK flag, <laughs> and lettuce emoji. <laughs> That's pretty clever. And on the day that the KMT team made the announcement, a meme started trending on social media. So Watch Out Taiwan is a self-described uh, public watchdog organization. It posted this image along with the caption, The KMT primary results are out. Han Guoryu wins the nomination with 44.8% support. However, that is less than the approval rating of Hong Xiaozhu, who won with 46.2%. Now, of course, Hong Xiaozhu, she was the person that the KMT picked in 2016, at least initially. She was later replaced just before the election by Eric Zhu, who was at the time the mayor of New Taipei. Now, this time around, Eric Zhu didn't fare as well in the race to become the KMT's nominee. Let's take a closer look at the meme. As you can see, Tai is on the left with a cat. She's known for her love of her cats. And on the right, Han is being manipulated like a puppet. He's known to be very China friendly. And on the bottom, Taipei Mayor Ko Wenzhou is seen saying, I'm considering a run. Now, after the KMT primary, people were also very interested to see what the second place winner, although I guess it wouldn't be a winner if you're <laughs> running to become the nominee, uh, that's Foxconn founder Terry Guo. People were interested to see what his response was. That's right. Many people remember that when Terry Guo first submitted his candidacy, he said that the sea goddess came to him in a dream and told him to run for president. KD Lily tweets, I'm Catholic, but I'm pretty sure that when Matsu appeared to Terry Guo, she told him to make a run for president even if the KMT primary doesn't go his way, right? Now, Guo has not revealed whether or not he will participate in next year's election as an independent. Now, with Han's nomination uh, certain, another image has been making the rounds on social media. Let's take a look. On the right is a picture of Times Square in New York. Campaign posters for Han have been superimposed on the billboards in the surrounding area. Now, it's important to mention that these pictures have been photoshopped. On the left is a picture of Times Square taken right after the images surfaced. Now, the concern is, is that a lot of people actually think that those doctored images are real and they've been circulating on the messaging app line. And some people are even saying that they're worried about what they're calling the cult of personality surrounding Han. Mm. OK, so that's this week's Hashtag Taiwan. Be sure to follow us on all relevant social media and leave a comment below. We would love to hear from you. And finally today, we leave you with a parting shot. Now, at the beginning of our show today, we showed you a photo and asked if you knew where it was. Let's take another look at that photo. We said this is an outlying island of Taiwan, but what is the blue stuff? Hmm. Where in Taiwan is this? Let's have a look at the answer. This is what's called the Blue Tears, a glittering night display of glowing algae on Mazu, one of Taiwan's outlying island groups. Although we just missed the best time to visit in June, Mazu offers plenty of other scenic spots. Now, there's another place here. This is a place that looks like it's in the Mediterranean, but these stone buildings are actually located in Qinbi Village on Began Island. The 36 Mazu Islands are about 160 kilometers from the main island of Taiwan, but they're actually just two kilometers away from the southern coast of China. So you'll find tunnels for army vessels to pass through and platforms for cannons. These are all stark reminders of the island's past as a frontline military outpost. Fascinating. I would love to go to see Mazu. It's beautiful, yeah. Well, we hope you enjoyed this edition of Taiwan Insider. Be sure to connect with us on social media and leave a comment below. And check out the links about the topics that we covered today. For Taiwan Insider, I'm Natalie So. And I'm Andrew Ryan. See you next week.